I'm Bradford Hanson Smith, and I'm here to give you a little bit of information about my exploration of the circle. We all know that is a circle. It is not a circle. It's only the drawing of a circle. It's the picture, a symbol that represents a circle. So if that's not a circle, that brings up the question, what is a circle? And so that's what we're going to be exploring, the circle using paper plates. Any kind of paper circle will do. Paper plates are real cheap, they're all round, and they're easy to fold. So that's why I use paper plates. But a circle can be cut out of any kind of paper, in fact, other materials. Where does the circle come from? That was the question that came to mind to begin with. What's the origin? If it's, if it's not that, then what is it, and where does it come from? And for most of us, we understand the circle by taking a sphere, cutting it apart, and we get two circles. In thinking about the sphere, it's the only form that's inherently whole, that demonstrates unity beyond all others. So what we're doing is we're taking what is whole and we're destroying the unity of it by cutting it into pieces. And this is what we do with most of life, is we take it apart, separate the pieces out, try and figure out how they go back together. And even if we take the sphere, put it back together, it has no unity. That's been destroyed. So the question in my mind was, OK, if everything we know about spatial patterns, about geometry, about mathematics, about life, is within the sphere, how do we get that information out without destroying it? So after thinking about that for a while, I realized, well, that's very simple. Take the sphere, compress it down to a flat plane, You've got a circular disk in space. Nothing has been lost. Nothing was destroyed. The circle is still whole. It's just the compression of the sphere. Through folding the circle, we're decompressing that information. We're getting all of the spatial, spherical, spatial arrangement and organization in the folding of the circle. We're getting all of the two-dimensional distortion of information in the creases, and we're getting all of the functions that, are, that mathematics describes in the movement of the circle. So we're getting the 2D, which is simply a distortion of 3D. We're getting the three-dimensional replication, and we're getting the uh, generalized abstracted information in the movement of the circle. So that's basically all we're going to be looking at, is we're going to be folding the circle, looking at the information that's generated, using that to know how to proceed. The circle generates information. It will be generating more information than we'll be using at any one time. Um, so we're going to go through this process step by step, fold by fold. It's Basically, we're learning a new language, a language of spatial organization, and the arrangement and the, the generation of systems and the interrelatedness of systems. This is a very simple process. There's nothing complex about it at all. I found that if, if you can fold a circle in half, you're able to do this. The tools we use on uh, paper plates, creasing stick, and that's just a paint stirring stick. It's cut in half, so that doesn't cost anything. Masking tape. Cheap masking tape works really well because it's stickier than the more expensive, which has less stick on it. And bobby pins, hair pins. And that's it. That's all that's necessary for what we're going to be doing. Let's put our hands up, pretend we're holding a sphere. So we've got a sphere in our hands. We can feel it there. This is sort of like a Tai Chi exercise where you, you know, move it around. Feel the sphere in your hands. 
know that it's there. Okay. Now locate the center of each palm and put those center points together. Now what happened to the sphere? Good. Become a circle. So we've compressed the sphere into a circle. We've got a circular plane in space. That's what we have here. But you don't see this any more than you saw the sphere. But you felt it. You knew it was there. So that brings up a whole other issue about the, when I draw a circle, it's not a perfect circle. If I had a compass and drew a circle, it would not be perfect. So we're talking something about the pattern of, and not the thing itself. So we're working off of the spherical pattern, the pattern of the circle, and we're using a paper plate to do that. So taking any two points on the circumference, doesn't matter where they are, just pick two imaginary points, put those points exactly together, make sure they don't slip, and then you don't even have to look to see if, it's line, if the edge is lined up. You just crease it. So any two points on the circumference when touched together will fold it exactly in half. Now, the question is, what have we got that we didn't have before? What's been generated? This is the information that's necessary to know what to do next, what options we have. We have three different choices in terms of how to fold it next. But we need to go through the information to understand which of those choices comes before the others. So when we look at it, we've got a diameter. Diameter, the word, means to divide into two equal parts. That's what we've done. We know they're equal because we put one on top of the other, and they fit exactly. So those shapes are congruent. We have straight edge that we didn't have before. We have points that we didn't have before. We have 360 degrees of movement. We have an inside and an outside. And they've just changed places, so we have an inverse function. That diameter is also an axis. Because when it goes inside outside, we've got a spherical pattern. We don't see the sphere, but we see the movement of the circumference as it moves 360 degrees. So we've got a pattern, a spherical pattern. Those two points, wherever they were on the circle, when you touch them together, created two more points. That gives us four points in space. That's a tetrahedron pattern. So what the circle has done in the first folding, it's, it's giving us its origin, which is the sphere, and where it's going, which is the tetrahedron. The tetrahedron is the only structural pattern that universally exists. So the rest of what we do with this circle is an exploration of that pattern and all of the forms and the systems that can be generated. Thus, when we look at all of the variations of shapes and forms behind me, these are just a few of what the circle can generate. We're not adding anything to the circle. We're not taking anything away from it. We're just moving it. Folding the circle is whole movement. The sphere is whole, and, all, and this is just the compression of that sphere, and we're folding it, so it's the movement of the whole to itself. Nothing is added. Nothing is taken away. That term actually came about when I was looking at geometry books, looking at the word geometry and realizing that most books don't even define the word and those that do define it as earth measure, measurement of things of the earth. So I thought, well, the earth is spherical. The sphere is whole. Measure, metry, that's about movement. So comprehensively, whole movement means geometry, but it's a comprehensive understanding of not just measuring parts, but the movement of the whole. And I think that that's a crucial difference today, is we need to get away from understanding the parts 
and concentrate a little bit more on the context, the wholeness of where those parts come from. Because as, as we will see as we get into the folding, the parts are endless. That's not the issue. The issue is understanding the wholeness, the movement of the whole, and how those parts are generated, formed, reformed, transformed, how they're all interrelated in, in a way that is absolutely demonstrable. It's not just an abstract concept of, yes, we're all connected and everything is interrelated. But in fact, there are ways of demonstrating that. So let's get on with the folding. Of all the information that we get from the folding of the circle, the most generalized information is that we folded a ratio of 1 to 2. We have fractions, we have parts. Everything that we've talked about is about parts. So the ratio is simply talking about the whole into two parts. Because it's the largest thing we can say, or the most generalized thing, that's the information we use to know what to do next. So we now have a choice. We can fold this into a proportion uh, or a ratio of 1 to 2 in three different ways. One gives us three diameters, one gives us four diameters, and one creates five diameters. So we have our choice. How do we know which one we want to do? Most often, I get 6. Let's do 6, because we always go for the more complicated. But in fact, 3 comes before 4 and 5 or 6. So. We're going to start with 3. If we know what 3 does, we will know what 4 and 5 do. They just do it to a different proportion. But the process, the patterns, the forming is the same. It's just proportionally different. So in folding it in a ratio of 1 to 2, we can fold point to point. That's one way. We can. We then move that up. We move the edge over so we have basically 1 to 2. So that gives us our second ratio. And the last ratio is 1 to 2. So those are the only options we have. That gives us 3, 4, and 5, the basis for all geometry, all of mathematics. So 3 comes first. So we're looking for the 3. And basically what we're doing is we're folding the semicircle into thirds. So you're just folding this over. And you're looking for that point in between where this and this are equal. So this is just using your eyes. Don't try and measure. Don't try and think about it. Just let your eyes tell you when they look even. Then you're going to fold the unfolded part behind. So what you've got is kind of like a Z, one over, one under. So you fold that under, and then you even up the points and the edges. So you're evening up, making everything even. If, if it's not even, then you can slide it back and forth until everything gets all your points, all your edges. Check both sides. Make sure that everything is even. Believe it or not, this is the hardest part of the entire process because we're relying upon our eyes. And we have not been trained to really use our eyes. We just take it for granted that our eyes see. So we need to attend to the fact that they can see proportionally. And any good carpenter will tell you that. I mean, they learn very quickly how to discern distance and measurement without having to use the rulers. So that's just a function of the eye. When it looks even to you, crease it with your straight edge. Open it up. And the question is now, what do we have that we didn't have before? What new information has been generated? I know. You need to look. This is about observation. You know, as you do the folding, you need to observe what it is that's generated. So when you look at that, you see three diameters. We had one before, we now have three. We have counting six areas. Counting is an important part of what we're doing because counting 
is part of what defines the properties of anything. And if we don't know the properties, we don't know what we're working with. So how many points do we have? Points mean different things to different people. In this case, we're talking about points of intersection where things come together. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, one point in the center, seven points. Everything is equidistant. We basically have a hexagon pattern. Let's go through and explore what we can do with three diameters. How many different configurations can we fold this plate into? We can, we can bring the ends together. We get a tetrahedron pattern. This is not a traditional tetrahedron form, but it is a tetrahedron pattern. Your four points, three surface planes, one open triangular plane. We can then further reform that into a quadrilateral. So it's like a little four-sided pyramid. We can then reform that into two tetrahedrons joined by a plane, a common plane. We can open that up. We've got two tetrahedrons joined by an edge length. So we have a planar, a planar joining and an edge joining. Let's open it out again. The hexagon is always flat. I qualify that because traditionally we think of the hexagon as flat because we're working with flat planes. As we get into it later on, you'll see that the hexagon can also curve in space in ways that normally we don't think about. But given that the hexagon is flat, and that's 6, 1 from 6 is 5, so we have our pentagon, and we're realizing now that 1, 2, 3, 4, and the space, we have to count the space. It's like music. You know, the notes without the space in between means nothing. And the shapes without the space are static and they have little meaning. Bring that in further. We can see we now have that quadrilateral. We can bring it in further. And we have the tetrahedron. So we've gone from our flat hexagon all the way up into our tetrahedron. There's another way of reforming it, sort of an in and out pattern, which reflects the first folding of the three diameters, going in, out, one over, one under, one in the center. So it's kind of a star-like configuration. These are all things that we need to think about when we're folding it and playing with it, just exploring what it will do. There are also trapezoids and other shapes that we can get in there, but those are for your exploration. The three diameters, what we're going to do is we're going to take one of those diameters and fold it in half. So that's the two tetrahedrons joined by an edge length. And we'll put a bobby pin in there to hold them. So we can talk about the symmetry. We can explore and observe the circumference. It crosses over on one side. We have the diameters that are all intersecting, create a, creating a vertex on the other side. It still moves. It's still about movement. But we want to stay with the symmetry. Because we've got a duality here, and we're working with a ratio of 1 to 2, we need to make another one of these exactly the same and put those together. I have some extras already made up so that we don't have to take the time to making more of them. But now, how do these go together? There's many different ways that we can put these together. But this is not about doing whatever we want to do. We're, we're following a systematic pattern of development here. So these show a symmetry, and they're joined on their edge lengths. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to keep that symmetry and join them on their edges. There's really only one way that that can happen. And then we'll put bobby pins in to hold them. So you can see now that they're both joined on. Now they still move. They still move in a perpendicular way. It gives you this quadrilateral in the center. So you'll notice that 
The triangles don't move. They remain stable. Triangulation is stability. It's structural. The only thing that's moving here is the four, the form of four. Formation, reformation, transformation. Four is about movement. OK, so we have a set of four tetrahedron. We need to make another set of four tetrahedron. And we'll do that in the same way. Hold those together with bobby pins. And we have two sets of four tetrahedron, four paper plates. We join these in the same way. you notice that on this side, we have the straight edges. The circumferences are crossing over on the other side. So there's a consistency as it develops. And so we put the edges, the four edges together in the same manner using bobby pins. Normally, this is something that when I'm working with groups of kids um, with all of this, it's problem solving. They have to figure out what to do. I'm, as here, where I'm showing you what we're doing, I don't show them. This is for them to figure out. This is where the information and the understanding comes from. So here we have, we're back to our sphere again. This is traditionally called a cube octahedron pattern. Or an update of that is Buckminster Fuller, who called it the uh, vector equilibrium. All of the creases, straight lines, all of the, the um, connections are all equal. And it's an equilibrium. So there's a, a beautiful symmetry about this. Again, we go back and we count how many points, how many square open square planes, how many triangular planes. There's a lot of information in there that we can go into through observation. But for the sake of time, I'm leaving that for you to discover and explore on your own. But what I would like to show you is that when we fold four diameters, we get the octahedron. And we're doing the same thing. We're taking one plate, folding it, putting two together, a set of two, putting two sets of two together, and we get something that looks very different, yet it's exactly the same process, the same folding, same diameter, same circumference, different proportion. The five diameters looks very different again, but it's the same process. The difference is this has now six circles in it instead of the four that these use. And that has everything to do with the five-fold symmetry. And that's just what happens naturally. So between the th I mean, these are your three primary spherical patterns that we're working with. Um, as I said earlier, if, you, if we know what this does, we know what these do. We'll put those aside. Let's go back to our three diameters again. There's a lot of information in these diameters. There's a lot of flat information, two-dimensional information, um, that we're not going to go into at the moment. And again, that's for your own exploration. You'll be able to make those connections as you go through. As you recall, this is about touching points. So we have seven points, six on the outside, and one in the center. To get full information, we need to know what is the relationship of each point to all the others. So we do that through touching points. We have an option. We can touch all six to the center. We can touch one to the center. Or we can touch three to the center. Those are really the only options. One doesn't give us very much. Three comes before six. So we will do one, skip one, go to the third one, put the points together. When you're putting the points together, it's very easy to see because the, the diameter lines up with itself. So if it's not on the center, you can see that it doesn't line up. This, again, is just using your eyes. When it's right on the center, then you crease it. 
So what you end up with is an equilateral triangle. And it's got its three bisectors, which are your three diameters. Everything that we know about angles and triangles is right here. You've just folded it. Anything in any of your, uh, your geometry books. You've got your isosceles, your scaling, your right angle triangles, left-handed, right-handed, right triangles. Uh, tremendous amount of information. One of the things that we understand is that the bisectors give us the midpoint of each edge. So we've got what is called a two-frequency triangle. Two-frequency because each edge is divided into two equal parts. That gives us the information to know where to fold next. So we take one of these folds, put it on the center, crease it, take us all the way across to the center of the opposite side, crease it, open it up, take this to the center of the opposite side, crease it. We have our tetrahedron form. So this is the first indication of the form, whereas that first fold gave us the pattern. So here we have our tetrahedron. The properties are simply counting. Four points, four triangle surfaces, six edges. That's it. Um, what does this really represent? When, when we hold it on the four points, we can see that it's really about movement. It's, it's not just a static shape or form. So your, your tetrahedron, where does that come from? What does it represent as a form? It all starts from a single sphere. The sphere to itself, the wholeness of what it is, generates two spheres. It's not putting two spheres together. It's very much like the, the ovum when it is ready to multiply. And it, it doesn't add something. It divides and multiplies. There's no separation. So two spheres, the duality to itself is two squared. It's four. This is your tetrahedron pattern. The extraordinary thing is space has been treated in between. Where there wasn't space before. There's been no separation, simply division. You can do the same thing by blowing up a balloon, squeezing it in the middle. Looks like two balloons, but in fact it's one. You can take that and squeeze it at right angles, and you have four balloons, what well, looks like four balloons, and they're all connected because it's a single surface. It's still singularity. It's whole. So here we see not just four points in space. We see four spheres, but we also have six points of connection. So we have a number pattern of 10 that represents the tetrahedron, four points of connection, or six points of connection, and the four spheres. That's, those six points of connection are defined by our six edges. So we see a direct translation from the spherical to the polyhedral, except we talk about this as four, and this actually is showing us 10. What this represents is not just one tetrahedron, but in fact, it represents four. So these are equivalent. This is not. So we have an interesting disconnect between the generalizations of polyhedra and the spherical formations that generate all of that information. Another way to look at that, we can take four of these and put those together in the same pattern. So you can see where this is exactly the same pattern as the spheres made with, this, with four circles where their connections have to be, the six connections have to be at the vertex points. And as you can see, the red triangle in the center, that creates what we're looking at here. So this is actually what is generated in spherical packing. And this is endless. You could add endless spheres to this filling space and creating space at the same time, because that's what you're doing on the inside.
there's a lot to explore if we were to then take one of these off we would then have a partial tetrahedron. Tetrahedrons don't come in partials, they come in holes. But we can, we can take it apart because we put it together, put three more on here, get an octahedron, we can begin to, we can get a cubic pattern. There's many ways of that matrix that we can go in and pull pieces out that show us different polyhedra uh, that are primary. Okay, let's go back and take a look at our three diameters. This is what it looks like in terms of a grid. It's just a triangular grid, three going in one direction, the other three going in the other direction. Um, so as you fold it, you know, that grid is going to reposition itself. When we fold it into the tetrahedron and we look at folded creases, this becomes a higher frequency grid. Same triangular grid, but a higher frequency, you've got more information. And this is simply your tetrahedron. By folding on the creases that are already there, we can see our tetrahedron. The beauty of the tetrahedron is that you can also reform it, the inside, outside. There are many ways to reform it so that we have the outside on the inside. All of these different possibilities of reformation allow us to move in another direction of forming. It is all information. There is nothing that the circle generates that is not informational. And in that way, it's very much like real life. It's always informational. It's giving us information about what's going on at this moment everywhere. When we look at the tetrahedron in the spherical form, there's a relationship of each sphere to all the others, the center of each sphere to all the others, or any place in between the centers between those center points. So in, in looking at it just generally, if this, the center of any one of these spheres in relationship to the center of another sphere is in what we call a golden ratio to the center of the space created by the spheres. So what we have is a relationship of what is formed, which are the spheres, to what is unformed, which is the space inside. So we have an interesting ratio of form to unform. And when you get into the Golden Ratio, the Fibonacci series, these are growth series in a number form that show a progression of development that is reflected in the geometry of spherical packing. Now, how that plays out, pi is a symbol, a term that we use for a number 3.1415 on into infinity. Simply what that means is that at 3.1415 is three diameters plus the difference between three diameters, the length of three diameters, and the length of the circumference. So what we're showing is that the diameter as the longest part of any circle can never equal the whole of the circle. How we fold that, what that looks like, is that with your triangle, we have, the di we have a bisector that is already in there, but it's not folded through the circumference on the other side. So just through refolding the creases that are already there and doing that three times because we have three diameters, we come up with pi. That allows us to then to open up that overlap to show the difference between what we see between the circumference and the hexagon, which is three diameters, six radii, and the difference is this little piece, which 
when folded, becomes a little vesica. And there's three of those. And so it's showing us the difference between the straight line and the curved line three times because we've got three diameters. So it's an interesting way of observing what pi represents in a real spatial way and not just as an abstraction. There's so much of mathematics that can be demonstrated just as easily and just as simply through the folds of the circle, which is one of the benefits of folding circles rather than talking about abstract concepts that we really don't know what they mean. There are many options in terms of we can push that in and have an open tetrahedron. We've already seen how we can fold it to the outside, inside. We can use it as a dual tetrahedron. So we're talking about the space in between. You have your tetrahedron here, but you also have another tetrahedron here. So it only has one plane and three planes that are open. So this is, in fact, a pattern of two tetrahedra because it has one, two, three, four, five points. And that's what you get when you put two tetrahedron together. So this is the form of what this is the pattern of. So again, we're talking about the space as much as the forms. OK, let's open this up. Now we talked about the properties and having four points, six edges, four surfaces. The question is now, when it opens up, has the properties changed? Yes, they have. We now have six points. And we have eight planes. Four of them are surfaces, and four of them are open planes. So you can see the triangle points. The triangles create triangle spaces. So in understanding that, it's something we're all familiar with. You've got space in between your fingers. You put them together. The fingers go in between the spaces created by the fingers. It's exactly the same thing. Triangles go into the space created by the triangles and you have an octahedron. The properties of the octahedron are six points, eight surfaces, and 12 edges. When we open this, we can open it down into a net, which is called a net. So here we can see all surfaces at the same time, whereas when it's in the octahedron form, we don't, because it's a spherical form and you never see the full sphere. You can only see it half at any given time. So I'm just going to put a piece of tape here to hold these two together in the net so you can see how it opens up, the sides connect, they give us this net. I'm going to put two more pieces of tape. So we're going to explore just a little bit of some of the reconfiguration of the octahedron. So we've got our octahedron. We half open it. So we've gone from our 4-8 our symmetry to our 5-10 symmetry. So again, this Remember when we were folding the three diameters and we were folding the pentagon, we had one, two, three, four, and the open space five. And so here we see it reoccurring again. We can take it back down the other way, and we end up with three tetrahedron joined on their internal planes. So we've just taken two tetrahedron, made an octahedron, reformed that into three tetrahedron. This is the beauty of the wholeness of the circle, is that all these things that we deal with in separation are all part of each other. There is no separation, but there is endless division. If we take and take it back to the net of the octahedron, let's go to this one. So we can see the, the, the 
triangular net of the tetrahedron. And we fold it this way. This is our pattern, one in the center and one off of each edge length. So it's a pattern of four tetrahedron. So you can see the importance of that two frequency tetrahedron even in a flat form. You have much more information. Now, when we look at this and see this, you can see the same thing. But look what happens when you get the inside folded to the other side. You've got white on black, black on white. This is, this is generally, this is what we cut off when we work with triangles and we eliminate the center one when we talk about the triangle shape. We've generalized all of the important information out and we're left with very little and we can do very little with it. This pattern of one in the center and one of each side Let's go back to our octahedron net. We have two open tetrahedron. If we pick one as the center, then we only have one off of each side, or off of one side, and you can see how that has moved up halfway. So we're still working with the ratio of one to two. To complete that pattern, we would need to put one there and one there. Now you can see where it, it looks like a pinwheel. If we were to put it on the other side or move it this way, it would be going in the opposite direction. So right away, we're, we're having to deal with right and left hand again. Is it, is it going to the right? Is it going to the left? And while that's usually not an issue in geometry, whereas it becomes a very important issue as chorality and chemistry, it is in fact very important because the geometry that we, that we are exploring is exactly the same patterns that we find in chemistry, biology, all of nature, art, whatever we do. It's about the same patterns. So look what happens when we begin to fold this up. So we're going to take this pattern where one is attached in that way and attach it the same way with each one of those. So you can see where now every vertex has four triangles and one open triangle around it. So that's the pattern we're working with. That's what the octahedron suggested. That's what the three diameters demonstrated. You can see now we're going back into much more of a spherical form. And this is what's called the icosahedron, but it's not in a form we're normally familiar with because we define a, uh, the properties of an icosahedron are 12 points, 20 triangular surfaces. And here we have only 16 surfaces. We've only used 16 triangles rather than 20. So that's kind of interesting in itself. Also the fact that those open triangles are in a tetrahedron arrangement. So everything here is tetrahedronal. It's just been reformed into another, another spherical arrangement. The beauty of this is that the inside and the outside are now accessible in the same way that the sphere. You see the center, you've got the outside, there's nothing hidden. So as you're moving through, it's the movement and the transformation that reveals what normally is hidden and we, don't, and we think is not there. We don't concern ourselves with what we don't see. Here, we see it all. Okay, we've seen how in folding the tetrahedron, opening it up, two tetrahedrons give us the octahedron. Four tetrahedrons open up, give us the icosahedron. These are all made with triangles. These are the first three of the five platonic solids that 
are primary to all spatial patterns. The other two, the cube and the dodecahedron, are really duals of these two, and everything comes from the tetrahedron. So there's, there's an extraordinary interrelatedness through movement and transformation of these things that traditionally have been separated out into five separate symmetries, five categories, and we have spent centuries trying to figure out all the different ways that they go together and interrelate when in fact they are the same thing, the tetrahedron in different form. So let's proceed a little bit further. Uh, we can take a tetrahedron. It has four surfaces. We have our dual tetrahedron joined on their surfaces. We can put one on all four surfaces. And that's what we normally call stellating. And a stellation is basically taking a triangle as a center point. So you've got one, two, three, four points, raising that point perpendicular off that plane. And you've created basically a three-sided pyramid or a tetrahedron. So that's the stellation, is just perpendicularly raising that center point off of that plane. And it doesn't matter how far, it's always a stellated plane. OK, so we do the same thing just by putting a tetrahedron onto the plane of another tetrahedron. We've taken that center point and raised it perpendicular off of that surface. When we do that all the way around, it's going to look like this. This has tape stretched between the points so that you can see that the points generate another tetrahedron, a larger tetrahedron. So we find that the tetrahedron through stellation creates a dual of itself. But you'll notice that the larger tetrahedron is pointing up. The smaller tetrahedron that was stellated is pointing down. So we have a different or orientation. We have a difference in scale or size. So we have to consider those differences. Normally, we do not. We just say the dual of the tetrahedron is itself. So we don't have, that's, it's redundant. So we talk about just a single tetrahedron rather than the tetrahedron as a dual. When we take the octahedron, we do the same thing. We can stellate each side. Actually, if we stellated each side, and we put another one over here, and another one on top, we would have a solid tetrahedron. What we would have is our two-frequency tetrahedron with the octahedron formed on the inside. So the tetrahedron forms the intervals of octahedron. We can take four, tetrahed or four octahedron and put those together in a tetrahedron pattern. And what we find is a configuration that looks like this. So this is a tetrahedron pattern. Normally, it's called a truncated tetrahedron because you can see where the octahedrons create tetrahedron spaces. So we can fill all those in and create a solid three-frequency tetrahedron. So when we talk about octahedrons, we're only talking about part of a tetrahedron. We're not talking about something that is separate. So the tetrahedrons create octahedrons. The octahedrons create tetrahedrons. So as we stellate the octahedron on all eight sides, and we string it with tape, we can see that it creates a star configuration. And by just stringing tape between all eight points, we have a cubic pattern. So you can see the 12 edges of the cube. So the 12 edges of the octahedron have now stellated out. They become 12 edges of the cube. The eight surfaces of the octahedron have become the eight points. And the six, the six points have become the six squares. So this is an inverse function of points and planes. So the dual of the octahedron is the cube. Now with the icosahedron, we can do the same thing, because all these are congruent triangles, they all fit on each other. So oftentimes, because this is a process that builds sequentially on itself, we're going to look at it in terms of a sequential development. So 
to take four tetrahedron, representation of our tetrahedron, place them around equally so that we've stellated four surfaces that are all equally placed around that. There are a number of approaches to figuring that out. You can locate the centers of the four circles, and that gives you an equal distribution of planes to be stellated, or you can take the open planes and use those as the four. And that will generate something that, using the center points, is a very different kind of configuration. So this is a tetrahedron pattern with, a, with an icosahedron center it, um, and open all the way through. If we then go ahead and stellate each of the four remaining open, we will get a cubic pattern because we will then have eight corners that create a cube pattern with an icosahedron center. To take the 12 remaining triangles and stellate those, we'll get a star configuration that looks like this, where here the tape has been strung between all the points so that we see that the, tw the 20 planes have been stellated to 20 points. And as those are connected, they create the pentagon. That gives us 12 pentagons because there are 12 points here, and we have an inverse function between point and plane. And that is another form of your dodecahedron, which is what this is. Now, this is formed with more creases in the plates and more folding, but you can see where it's just the 12 pentagons. When we get into the back to pi, the golden ratio, the Fibonacci series, all of those numbers that are irrational numbers. Again, back to they're irrational because it's not rational to think that any combination of parts could ever equal the whole. But there are specific relationships, growth relationships, relationships about movement in proportion that generate formation. And so we can see that if we take and begin to string. This we've got, here we've got this, there. So we've shown the relationship of every point to every other point. We get our pentagon star. And it's in that relation, that's in that, that um, golden ratio relationship. So this is not an abstraction that we pick out from the ether and apply it and can demonstrate it by drawing pictures of it and then find it in the polyhedron. It comes from the spatial organization and relationships of those organizations as we develop. We have done nothing but fold tetrahedrons, and we've created all the five platonic solids. You can continue this development of stellation. Like if we take this plane, the center point, raise it up, what happens there? Same thing here. We have a square-based pyramid. We can raise that up on all eight sides, and it totally ch changes the configuration. Um, an example of that might be here's a stellated dodecahedron. Again, these were folded using different folds. We can get into that. We, we will get into that later. But you can see where each one of these flat planes has been folded into a pentagonal cone. And what will that do? That takes us back into, into uh, 12 points and 20 planes. So it's all interrelated through the tetrahedron in a way that we just cannot demonstrate when we're dealing with these things as separate individual objects. So here we have representation of the five platonic solids, or the five only regular polyhedra. We have the tetrahedron, octahedron, icosahedron, the three that are made with triangles, the square cube, and the pentagon, the dodecahedron. So we have the tetrahedron, which is four triangles, the octahedron, which is eight triangles, and here's a 
an icosahedron of 20 triangles, but this was made with two circles put together, folded with more folds in it than what we did with this. This is only four, this is two. Here we see it in a solid form that we're more familiar with. We're more familiar with the solid form of the cube. And what we created was the cube as an extension or a stellation of the octahedron. But you'll notice that the cube, part of the properties are six squares. You'll notice that this particular unit has no squares at all. It is all tetrahedra. Here is a little bit more familiar in that you're seeing all 12 sides. They're not normally we're used to seeing them as flat and solid. Here they've been folded in and out a little bit. So it gives you a better idea of what this represents. We're more familiar with them in these solid forms. But in fact, we see that they really are about just the tetrahedron. We've folded nothing but tetrahedron. And in doing that, we have far more information with this form of modeling than we do the flat plane solid form. OK, let's go back to the three diameters. We've seen the triangular grid that the three diameters make. And by folding three points to the center, we created the tetrahedron, which is the tetrahedron grid. So we can see that. Now what we're going to do is take that grid to a higher frequency by folding all six points to the center. So we'll start with our one diameter. And again, we folded it into thirds. So we're folding one over, one under, getting everything even, just visually looking at it. Don't need anything more than your eyes to tell you if it's accurate or not. If it's not, you even it up, and we get our triangular pattern. We open that up, we have our three diameters. So this time we're going to fold all six to the center. So we just take that, fold it to the, put the point under the center, crease it, open it up, go to each one. So you can see it doesn't take much time at all once you understand where the point on the outside is and where the point on the center is, and they're connected by a line. Match them up, and you've got all six points folded to the center. And what you have is a hexagon star. This is the first form of the hexagon shape that we see. There are three more folds remaining to complete this sequence of what I call a four-frequency grid. And that is what we've done is we've shown all the relationship of this point to the center, this point to that point. We're showing, but we haven't got them all yet. We're working with three diameters. So you take this diameter, it goes to the center. That point goes to the center, same diameter. Now we're going to take those points, opposite points, and put them together. So the two opposite points of each diameter touch each other, and it gives us another crease. So we, do, we have three diameters. We do that three times. Touch the endpoints, the opposite endpoints of each diameter together, and crease it. What this does is now gives us a grid, and we have three more diameters. The first three diameters are divided equally in half, so that makes it a four-frequency diameter circle. The other three diameters are not divided in half. They have a different proportion division. So they're bisecting diameters. They function very differently. The only thing we have to pay attention to are the six points. That's our anchor. No matter how complex it gets, that's where those are our reference points. OK. What this looks like when we color that in is it'll look like this. So we've gone from three diameters to our tetrahedron, folding three to the center. And then we've got all six folded to the center. What this shows us is the relationship of every point to all other points, the all possible combinations of seven points in your hexagon pattern. The, the beauty of this is that we, 
we can then do the same thing. We can fold our triangle, and we now see that we have our hexagon. We didn't have that when we folded the tetrahedron. We cannot do with this what we all that we can do with a tetrahedron. It will not go into a tetrahedron. But it will do that in very different ways. You can begin to fold in different parts. You find that now we have a tetrahedron that is stellating the center triangle of the four triangles that we that is the net of the tetrahedron. So you can you can see that. So this can be used as a single plane that's stellated in making a tetrahedron or any of the other things a tetrahedron can make, but in a very different configuration. There are hours of directions of where this folding can go. But this is not the complete grid that this is a four frequency. We need to take it to an eight frequency grid. And what that means is that each one of these three diameters is now divided into eight equal sections. So that gives us a smaller grid. We have more information to work with. We can do far more complex folds. So it's, it's very much like an octave in music, where an, you, all you need is an octave to compose whatever kind of music in whatever style wherever you want to go with it. And it's the same with this. You've now got an octave of folds, and you can go wherever you want to go with it. As far as I can tell, it's pretty much unlimited in the ability to reform, transform the circle, and particularly in multiples as you begin joining them, which many of what you're looking at here represent. Multiple circles joined from just what we've already done. Now, how to get that fold is very simple. We've got Basically, what we have is when you look at one diameter, you have a set of three parallel lines. So you have three diameters, and you have three sets of parallel lines. So you've got 12 creases altogether. They give you the information to know where to fold next. You take this point on the same diameter. You go all the way across. So what you're seeing is this point is going to go to that point, the intersection of that line. So you take it all the way across. Put the points together, crease it, and you can see how this section is now divided in half. So we're doing the same thing, just touching points. Take this point, go to the closest point of intersection, match up the points, crease it, and we now have, this is still a two frequency. This half is now a four frequency, one, two, three, four equal divisions. As we do that all the way around, then it becomes your complete eight frequency grid. And we can look at that without having to go through all the folding right now. This is what your grid looks like. So what you're doing is you're going all the way across. It's almost like a dance step. That's one way I sort of look at it. You step out, crease it, step in, crease, go to the next diameter, step out, crease, step in, crease. Do that all the way around all six points, and you've got your eight frequency grid. Now here, the interesting thing is that while these two do very different things, they come together here. And this will do anything that either of those two can do, plus a whole lot more, because you've got more information. So as you find the enfolded equilateral triangle, you can see that we have a lot more information to work with. So we can then fold the tetrahedron. And you can now see that there's a lot of information that we didn't have before. You've now got your, your hexagon within your three frequency tetrahedron. Now with this, because we have the folds there, we can truncate it. Truncation traditionally is taking and systematically cutting off the endpoints. It's, it's like going back to the wholeness of the sphere. You don't cut into it because then you've destroyed the unity and you've got waste. And traditionally, that's what we do. We cut off the corners, we throw them away, we concern ourselves with what's left. Here, you're just 
truncation is a movement in. Creases allow us to do that. And stellation is simply a movement out. So here we have a completely different figure by truncating using the creases that are already there. We have triangles and hexagons. So this is one of the 13 semi-regular polyhedra, which is a subclassification of the regular polyhedra, which made sense 2,500 years ago, but in folding the circle, it doesn't hold true because we're not classifying two, generalization, two general categories. We're looking at a transformational system of the whole where nothing is added or taken away. So the, the advantage here is that you're seeing all of the stuff in between those five figures that traditionally gets left out, and therefore we don't even know is there. There is no way to anticipate from the drawing of the circle, the image, what can be generated either in information or in the forms and the systems. So you can see something, something like this. This is just one example of five circles put into a tetrahedron form, reformed to a frequency. Now when we take something like this, same grid, same, same paper plates. Actually, there's four of them here. There's a center one here. That doesn't need to be there. We could form that without it. So that basically the outside is four. The outside of this is four. It's just a reforming. So any one of these things can be taken apart, flattened out into the circle, given that you've got the eight frequency grid, reforming that grid into any of the others. So they're all totally transformable. Uh, there's nothing that is separate or isolated from anything else. And that's the beauty of the demonstration of folding the circle, is that it shows that kind of interrelatedness and that kind of integration of the whole. And it's not dealing with parts, because the parts are endless. We can make these models for, I mean, this is a small part of what I've done over the last 17 years of folding circles. And that experience tells me that it's endless in terms of what can be formed, just like it's endless of the kinds of music that can be composed through, through using an octave. Now, this can be taken down to a 16th, a 32nd, a 64th, and you've got a tremendous amount of information, far more than you've got here, but you don't know what to do with it because it's too much information unless you understand the process of folding the tetrahedron, how the tetrahedron generates the other four platonic solids, and how those then are all interrelated and are able to create endless kinds of systems. Then, when you go into the higher frequency folding, you have an understanding of the vocabulary, we'll say, and vocabulary of organization, shapes and forms, and how they work together. Um, that's the potential. I look at this and say, I've been folding circles for 17 years. I don't know anybody else who's spent even half that time folding circles. And then I think about the thousands of years that we've been drawing pictures of circles and what we've developed from a static image that doesn't generate anything. And I leave you with that potential. It's endless. <laughs>